The Windsor, Ontario trial of a man accused of running down a Muslim family with his pickup truck in London, Ontario, two years ago, is hearing more evidence today about an alleged racist manifesto. In the document titled A White Awakening, Nathaniel Veltman refers to himself as a white nationalist and peddles conspiracies about Muslims. He calls on others to make life for Muslims very uncomfortable. It ends with the same line found in the manifesto of the gunman in the New Zealand mosque massacre that left 51 people dead. Veltman is charged with intentionally hitting five members of the Abzal family with his truck, killing four and injuring a fifth. He has pleaded not guilty to murder and attempted murder. For more on this, we are joined live in studio by Sabrina Gafar Siddiqui. She's a professor of sociology at Sheridan College, specializing in anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, Sabrina, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's important to have this conversation. In court this week, prosecutors are talking about this document. It's being described as a manifesto uh, titled A White Awakening, and in it, the accused allegedly calls for a violent revolution against Muslims. Your reaction to that? Well, it's interesting that in the manifesto he talks about making life uncomfortable for Muslims, um, which is a, a real, you know, far stretch away from killing Muslims. But here you can see the goal of intimidation, right, which mm. is one of the first things that you see in terrorism, the definition of terrorism, which is to intimidate a group of people. So I think in his goal to make life uncomfortable for Muslims, to drive them away, it was to kill a few in order to scare many more. And I think something that I really want to kind of point at is um, we also know that in a couple of the interviews, police interviews after he was arrested, he mentioned that the number one thing that radicalized him was the narrative of the Muslim grooming gang in the UK. Mm -hmm. Now, this Muslim grooming gang conspiracy theory was actually debunked by a report by the Home Office in 2020. But it shows how even something that can be officially debunked can stay in the minds of people to such an extent that they feel like this entire group of Muslims is a threat to white people so much that they will do something about it. Even if it's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, this so-called manifesto that we're talking about, it ends with the same line found in the manifesto uh, of the gunman behind the New Zealand mosque massacre. In fact, Nathaniel Veltman went on to tell police that that was his inspiration for the London attack. How, how troubling is that to you? Absolutely. And, you know, part of me feels like a little bit annoyed because I remember when, you know, the Quebec mass shooting happened. It was, it was devastating. Uh, Canadians came together in shock and horror and um, support for Muslims, right? And then a few years later, we saw the New Zealand mass shooting happen. And we found out the New Zealand mass shooter was inspired by the Quebec mosque shooter. So there is this line that you can see being drawn from Canada to New Zealand back to Canada, making this a very global problem. And again, my the reason why I mentioned the UK grooming gang narrative is, again, this connecting to the UK. And this is what points us to the fact that Islamophobia and anti-Muslim hatred and racism is a global phenomenon. It's not a Canadian thing. It's not an American thing. It's, you know, uh, something that is... Interestingly, you know, many people say that these white nationalist extremist groups were born in Canada, um, thrived mm. in Canada, you know, flew under the radar in Canada, and then they were transported to places like, you know, America, where, mind you, not sure if you know, they probably do, that Canada is the leader of all G7 countries as being the country where the most Muslims have been killed because of hate. Wow. So here we are pointing fingers at America for being this racist, terrible place when in our own backyards we've got this horror taking place and where we are leaders, not the kind of leaders we want to be. Not the kind of leaders we want to be. I have to ask you about this, Sabrina. The prosecution here trying to prove that the killings here were an act of terror by a white nationalist. This is the first time Canada's terror laws are being tested uh, in court, in front of a jury, in a first-degree murder case. Talk to us about the implications and what kind of precedent this case and this verdict might set. So I can't stress enough how important 
terrorism charges are. And I had argued the same thing back when we were trying Alexander Buzanet, how important it was for us, even with the little bit of evidence that we had, which clearly pointed to him kind of being inspired by an ideology, that it was important for us to define it as terrorism and charge it as terrorism. And the reason why is because Ter the terrorism label has been assigned to Muslims, so much so that they are hated for that same terrorism. So in his manifesto, Nathaniel Veltman states that it's because of Muslim terrorism that he wants to get rid of them, and that's why he hates them. So. In order for us to fight Islamophobia and anti-Muslim hatred, the first thing we need to do is disrupt these myths, these narratives that are used not just in violent hate, but in the political sphere, right, with rhetoric. And, and here is where I really have to kind of mention this, this idea of being an ally versus being an accomplice, because we are in Islamic Heritage Month right now in October, a day after September 30th, Truth and Reconciliation Day. And I know that the inclination is to really celebrate the Muslims of Canada and talk about the, you know, all the richness that Muslims bring to this country. But we as Canadians are also very good at brushing our dark history under the rug, as we have seen with uh, the history of the atrocities against in Indigenous people. And I think it's imperative that during this month, especially, we need to shed light on the horrors that have taken place against Muslims. The kind of everyday racism that they experience, the structural Islamophobia and anti-Muslim hatred that we see um, that, you know, are actually propped up by political discourse and policies like Bill 21. And um, I, I honestly can't say enough about this. Muslims have been securitized and surveilled, like there's been this focus on securitization and surveillance of Muslims for so long with this war on terror. I think now we need to really think about the security of Muslims. All right. This has been a powerful conversation. That's all the time we have. But Sabrina Ghaffar Siddiqui, I want to thank you so much for this conversation.